nobody really wants to be a position holder in, inside an organization. We want to be difference makers. Like mm-hmm. what I have learned studying some of the best leaders and the top contributors inside of organizations is that people come to work every day desperately wanting to be, um, we might say, seen or heard. But like in my parlance, it's they want to be utilized. They want to be given challenges. They want to solve hard problems. They want to contribute, not a fraction of their capability, but they want to contribute all of it. And the best leaders create an environment and a culture where people can contribute fully. Welcome to the Culture Gooder podcast with Stephen Lease and Sean Tinney. This podcast is a behind the shades look at creating and changing culture inside of Gooder sunglasses. You can live with the status quo, you can challenge the status quo, or you can do what we do at Gooder and status the quo challenge. Welcome everybody. We have a very special guest with us today, New York Times bestselling author, Liz Wiseman. Liz, thanks for being here. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. Awesome. Liz, big fan of your work. Uh, Before we get into multipliers and impact players and all things culture, will you please tell us an interesting story about you growing up that led to the person you are today? Could be anything you want. Well, um, I'm a daughter of a donut maker. Awesome. Started work at 13, got robbed at gunpoint at my dad's donut shop. So I've been working... I've been working for a long time. And, you know, that was probably one of the worst conversations, having to call my dad and say, you know, I gave him all the money. (laughs) But I think, (laughs) I'm assuming that's what you wanted me to do, is just hand over the money. Um, uh, You know, I was very popular as a daughter of a donut maker on our block. Like, it was only day-old donuts that we offered to the neighbors, but we were popular. Um, uh, Let's see, other things that have shaped me, I was... I was voted high school class clown. Oh, strong. Yeah, and you know, it hasn't really changed a whole lot for me. Um, (laughs) And it's funny, (laughs) all of my research, I end up like finding how humor ends up helpful in the workplace and why it's such an important part of culture. And I think some of it is true and some of it is just like my deep need to like redeem myself in my mother's eyes. (laughs) That's not a couple (laughs) complete screw up like who's gonna you know bring shame upon the family name um like those are a few things that have shaped me but i think my i I was gonna say i mean um what what is your so you started working at 13 i I also started working working for my dad's landscape company when i was 11 and uh there's something in there i mean like you when you what's your biggest takeaway from working so early well, I, I've always worked and yeah, like for me, work has such positive associations. I mean, other than being robbed at gunpoint, um, <laughs> but like to me, work was a way to pay for clothes when I was in high school that my parents wouldn't have, have purchased for me. I, I put myself through college. I didn't have any parental support through college. And so work has all these positive associations. It's a way to make something. It's a way to create something. It's a way to make progress, to get ahead. It's um, a way to build muscle, a way to, I don't know, progress, prove yourself. So I'm, oh, I'm fascinated with sort of the current zeitgeist that says somehow work is a dirty word. Like work. Yeah is damaging work hurts you work is to be avoided and i i have a hard time i like i do have a hard time understanding that i have to work to understand the damaging effect that work has on people i agree one thing that i'm hyper focused on at gooder is our our long-term remarkable vision for everybody inside the company is that we celebrate the work over the results because you can the work never ends and, you know, it's really way more important that you fall in love with the process over over anything, which sounds kind of like what you're alluding to, right? 
Yeah. And I understand how work can hurt people. And I definitely understand how bosses can do deep damage to people around them. That I understand really clearly. But I think there's there's so many ways that work and and having success and overcoming obstacles are so positive for us. They build strength, they build character, they build pride, a sense of achievement, a sense of identity, a sense of community and belonging that I just don't want us to lose that as we um, maybe fixate now in this moment of time about some of the the hidden costs of work on well-being. But I I guess I'm just like, I'm pro-work. And, and I too. guess that's I, led to this lifelong fascination with how do we make a workplace where people can do brilliant work and go home feeling great about what they did that day. So Liz, I, I'd love for you to actually juxtapose your two books, Multipliers and Impact Players. So we've used Multipliers at our uh, company and for our listeners out there, the book is Multipliers, How to Get the Best Leaders, How, uh, how the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. And I've really focused on that here. But when I read impact players, that's actually way more. One's top down and one's bottom up, it feels like. But when I read impact players, it feels like what you're talking about is people who actually just love the work more than anything. Is that that true? And and maybe just describe, like, how do you view them side by side? Mm, Well, I think they are two sides of a coin. and, And the coin is how do we create space for people to do brilliant work? You know, I I guess in some ways, this thesis I've developed over the years of my research and my own experience as a corporate manager in, you know, a, a, a wonderful but tough environment that I grew up in called Oracle Corporation. But it's this it's this deep belief that I have that people want to be utilized at work. Yeah. It's about how do we create space for people to do brilliant work. And it's this this belief that nobody really wants to be a position holder inside an organization. We want to be difference makers. Like Mm -hmm. what I have learned studying some of the best leaders and the top contributors inside of organizations is that people come to work every day desperately wanting to be, um, we might say, seen or heard. But like in my parlance, it's they want to be utilized. They want to be given challenges. They want to solve hard problems. They want to contribute, not a fraction of their capability, but they want to contribute all of it. And the best leaders create an environment and a culture where people can contribute fully. Like all of my intellect, like it's that kind of experience we have at work where I'm like, man, I am using every IQ point like the good Lord gave me. You know, I'm like, I'm using yeah. everything I've got and begging for more as I'm trying to like figure out the hard problem. People are asking me to do hard things. They're looking to me. They're listening to me. Like people want to contribute at their fullest. The best leaders see that. And they create an environment where people can give 100% of their capability and get smarter and more capable in that process. So that's multipliers, looking at how some leaders see and use all of the available intelligence on a team, create an environment where people can show up, play big, make an impact, be fully utilized. Impact players is looking at what is our own role in that like how do we show up to work so that we're not position holders who you know leave a day of work like tired but drained and frustrated you know where we're sort of turning a crank and doing a job but how do we become true difference makers how do we make sure that our work experience is one where we're working hard, but we're making a difference. We're making an impact and the experience isn't exhausting. It's exhilarating. Yeah. Do you think that uh, to be a good leader, you have to be an impact player? No, but I think you have to understand what, 
what drives people. Mm-hmm. You know, you recently, I, I believe, had Dan Pink, uh, yep. you know, on your podcast. And Dan is a master of understanding, like, what drives people. And, you know, it's, I love it when people say, man, I read Drive, I read Multipliers, and these two things just, they're congruent. They sit side by side. Yeah. Understanding that people have these intrinsic drives. And in some way, what a leader is, is someone who just, they don't motivate people. They just simply don't demotivate people. Oh, that's interesting. I could say, I mean, how, what's a common trait of how you see leaders demotivating people? Well, we get in their way. We make them jump through crazy hoops. We create procedures. We create all of these artificial carrots that aren't what really drives people, you know, which is purpose and mastery and learning. Um, You know, sometimes, you know, a lot of times we think, oh, good leaders, they remove obstacles, they remove blockers. But in many ways, our biggest blockers um, are ourselves. And it's just like getting yeah. out of people's way so that they can do brilliant work. Oh, yeah. Uh, so in the world of in impact players, you talk about impact players versus contributors. And you actually call it like contributors is a, is a really good thing. You know, like, like we would love mm. a bunch of contributors. Do you think, I guess, could you speak to, there's a, when I read impact players, the people that I would give this book to a gooder, for example, they're already impact players and they would love it. And I think maybe somebody who wouldn't wait might struggle. Like can people become, can you, can you move somebody from a contributor and impact player? And as a leader, like, like how, what is my role in that? Is it sitting down, understanding what motivates people, creating the challenge? Like how would you go about coaching me to help people move from contributor to impact player? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I mean, there's a lot in that question. So yeah, yeah. Let me <laughs> Let's start with like, what's the difference between what I call a contributor and an impact player? How does someone become an impact player? And then I think that the third piece of that is what can leaders do to build more of these impact players on their team? So an impact player is someone who is a standout contributor, who creates extraordinary value, who is a difference maker, not a position holder in an organization. And there's someone who raises a level of play on a team. Like teams are better when they have these impact players. Of course, it's a metaphor I borrowed from the sports world. We know who the impact yeah. players are out on the field. The same holds true in the workplace. So the research that um, that we did was to go to 170 managers and ask them to identify two people on their team. So we had 170 managers, double that in data points, 340 data points. We asked them to identify two people, one who who was smart, capable, hardworking, and who was doing a fine job. And we called them contributors, typical contributors, ordinary contributors. The second uh, of whom was someone who was smart, capable, and hardworking, and really no more smart, capable, and hardworking than the other person. But this is someone who's making an extraordinary impact, delivering work of inordinate value on a team. And what we found is that, first of all, these ordinary contributors were no slackers. They weren't lackeys. These were people who did their job well, who followed direction, took ownership, were focused, carried their weight on teams. In some ways, they're like stellar contributors. But what we found is that they were stellar in ordinary times. But... What really differentiated the contributors from the impact players was how they handled ambiguity and uncertainty. Because once problems got messy, you know, we would find that the ordinary contributors, they did their job, they did their job well. The impact players were doing the job that needed to be done. And we all know like that difference with like the colleague who's heads down doing their job and doing it well, but they can't see. Actually, there's something going on around us right now. We have this emergent problem or opportunity like, whoa, I'd love to have you focus on that. The impact players are finding kind of the hot topics, hot projects, hot buttons, and they're putting their energy there. You know, it's how they dealt with unclear roles. The ordinary contributor is willing to lead, but they're waiting for someone to appoint them, waiting for somebody else to clarify roles where the impact players, 
they're all over it. They're taking charge. They're providing this leadership, but it's a leadership that sort of rises and, and fades based on need. And there were a number of these other differences, but it was absolutely how they dealt with ambiguity and uncertainty. And like so many of my research projects, I study these archetypes, these differences in people, but what you come to see is it's actually not about categories of people. Like, oh, you know, it's not like a duck, duck, goose game, you know, that yeah. children's game where you say like, okay, you know, contributor, contributor, impact player, contributor. <laughs> these, are, these are really, but it's what people are often tempted to do with the research and the books is categorize people. Yeah. Just like, oh, multiplier, diminisher. You start to see that these are actually mindsets and these are modes of working that we move in and out of. I mean, I could tell you all about times where I have Ooh. been an impact player, but I can tell you about times where I got myself in this contributor mode, doing my job, you know, kind of like phoning it in and, and doing good work, but a little bit missing the action, you know, or telling myself, well, that's not really my job. It's not my place. They wouldn't want me to. The higher ups can deal with this. Not my problem. Not my circus. Not my monkeys. Whatever. Pick your you know saying of choice yeah. above my pay grade. And I found every time I'm in that contributor mode, work sucks. Yeah. But when I'm in that impact player mode, yeah, I'm working hard. But work is. It's fun. It's yeah, fun. I mean, I love this it's idea right, that of actually. the idea of people aren't just a contributor or an impact player, right? I mean, I just I just jumped there in my mind, but this is a there is a fluidity here, um, and so this world of a mindset because there are days when I would actually say I would I'm probably closer to a contributor, um, uh, or like a, a good analogy I would use this is sometimes to work out. I just, I'm like, well, you know what, Steven, this is going to be a half-ass workout today, and that's fine. It's better than none. And sometimes days at the office, if you just don't have it, but striving constantly to be an impact player, uh, do you think that even the power to just recognize the days that you're being a true impact player and the days where you're not, is that that's is that also just a huge importance? Because like that actually strikes me as maybe one of the more important is just self-awareness of of, am I being a great multiplier right now or am I being a diminisher? What, what's your kind of thoughts on that? Exactly. Um, just like, you know, this distinction between multipliers and diminishers. Yeah. It's, these are modes we move in and out of. And, you know, if you want to be more of a multiplier, it's, it's about minimizing your diminishing moments. And it's almost like tracking them, like, okay, diminishing, diminishing, like, okay, oh man, I was on fire in that meeting, very much a multiplier. And, and shifting the balance so that you have a lot more multiplier moments than diminishing yeah. moments. Like I have, I have inside of me lurks a raving diminisher, and you know <laughs> it gets out every now and then. In certain situations bring it out, <laughs> certain people bring it out. But if you lead like multiplier by rule, you earn the right to have some diminishing moments by exception, and they don't have a diminishing effect on the people you lead. You've built the trust, the safety, the expectations, the culture for people to continue to show up at their best. And I think being aware of how we move in and out of these mindsets, it's the same process with wanting to really build a high impact culture is are people able to work? I think the question leaders should ask is not like, is this person a contributor or an impact player? It's, do we have a culture that allows people to show up and play as big as they intrinsically want to play? Do we have a culture that permits people to step out of the confines of their job and do the job that needs to be done? Do we have a culture that allows people to step up and lead their peers without anyone appointing them leader? Do we have a culture that says, you know what, I've been normally leading this, I'd love to pass the baton and share the burden and the blessings of leadership with someone else? Like, Do we have a culture that allows people 
to not just take ownership, but to hold on to that ownership when things get hard. And instead of handing it off to higher ups, like, okay, let's have Stephen deal with us. He's the boss. He's the founder. Do you have a culture that allows people to say, you know what, we've run into big obstacles. I'll keep driving us forward, but I need you, boss, to essentially come to work for me on this. Like, you know what, I'm going to clear this, but I need your help here and there. You know, do we have a culture that allows people to work in the lightest ways possible so that they can deal with the heavy workloads? Um, so I think it's really about, do we create a platform? And what I would love is for every leader not to be asking, how do I get more impact players? Is to be asking, am I the kind of coach an impact player would work for? Like, yeah. do I even deserve impact players on my team? Because they won't work that, for anyone. That is the... That's actually the crux. That last bit is, is right. Is right on. Is as leaders, uh, I love that. Am I the type of leader that an impact player would want to work for? And if if not, then that if yes, I probably already have them on the team, and I have a lot of them here. And if not, then I need to look at myself and not figure out how to make contributors impact players. Yeah. And have I given people permission to work this way? You know, when I really step back from impact players and I step back from the book and I look at it, fundamentally, it's a way of working that is, it's not harder. And I'm not sure it's even smarter. It's more courageous. Mm-hmm. And, and that kind of courageous, rangy, riskier, well, the courageous and rangy behavior is riskier. Yeah. And so as leaders, have we given people permission to work this way? Yeah. Or have we just let the structures of the organization, the job descriptions, the workflows, the org charts, the hierarchy, the approval levels, the escalation matrices, like all of that gunk has it so um, tangled an organization that people can't help but just work in contributor mode. Like, yeah. how do we kind of remove all of that from people? Yeah, a couple of things we do here I'd love to hear your in, um, input on is, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think that we try to create space to allow uh, people to play big and fail big. One of the ways mm-hmm. we do that, uh, every, every trimester I do my trimester early review in front of the company and I always ask, what do people want to talk about? And the the, t- the top of the list, and so now I just lead with this, is the biggest mistakes I've made from the last quarter uh, or the last trimester. So I model that behavior, but also as a company, every year we have what's called the flock up of the year award. And it is the team that made took the biggest swing and had the biggest failure. And it is a sought after prize. And, and all of this is just, there's heuristics in there, but we're also just trying to create a space for, for people to play big and make it soft when they fail. I would just love to hear your, your thoughts on that type of mindset as a, for, for a company. Well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, like I said, I tend to have a, a, a bit of a humor, like orientation towards work. And I know in my own leadership, like I, I, we had this kind of practice of just laughing off people's failure. Basically we mocked people. <laughs> When they fail, mock them. Yeah, okay. Don't don't hang up just now uh, because it's not about mocking people who fail. It's about laughing off our failures. And yeah. I think maybe this idea was prompted by um, oh, I think it was called the Double Goal Coach, uh, a book I read about um, coaching youth. And it, its its point was that great coaches have rituals that help players move beyond their failures. Like, I remember one of them was the flush thing. Like if somebody really did a bonehead move, like screwed up, like scored an own goal, like what they would do to help that player, like shake that off is they would do something. And like one of them was like, oh, that's like, we're going to flush that down the toilet because that (laughs) one is crap. Um, But 
we used to have like every week I'd be like, okay, screw up of the week. And I remember one, it was something my buddy Ben did. And I'm like, okay, everyone, you got to hear this one, Ben, tell everyone (laughs) what you just did this week. And he'd be like, okay, I got a doozy. Like I actually da, 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 da. And we would laugh at Ben. Ben would laugh at himself. And then it's like this, like shake it off, just get it out of you. Because unless you can laugh at yourself, it's hard to move past those things because we feel a sense of shame. So, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And so like everyone has a different personality. Some people are going to laugh it off. Others are going to create a lot of like um, thoughtful safety about how you respect people who've done that. That's not my style. It's probably not your style either, no. but rituals to help people like take risks and move beyond them. And, you know, it's funny, I did a similar thing with my own team. We would meet quarterly and, you know, we're an all remote team and we would often start our our full day quarterly meetings with, hey, what are you proud of? Let's do a review of all of our wins. And we did some of that and I'm like, and so I'm like, (laughs) this is killing me, all this success. And I said, hey, you know what? Let's start off today this session, but let's just talk about things we're kind of embarrassed about. Like, what are some things you you didn't do this last quarter? What are you disappointed in yourself or others? And at first people were like, for real? And then we go around the group and people are like, you know, I had really hoped to get to this, but the truth is I didn't because I was focused on this and I really wanted to and I feel bad and everyone's going through it. It's cathartic and people are like, yeah, I screwed this up too. I didn't get this done. It was way better than bragging over all of our successes. And we're like, okay, let's go. We we actually have a Slack thread here at Gooder that is uh, like a, a... Block ups, and so you, if you mess something up, it is just you should just like unburn yourself on the Slack thread, and it is like very much a people like there's like a listen to this thing I fucked up today, and I yeah. I think it's a very healthy way to just take ownership and 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 you create the ritual around that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. When I get a terrible you- book review, I often will post it to my friends, <laughs> you know, on social media, and I'm like, and people are like. Ah! Because otherwise I dwell on it (laughs) and like, wow, look at what this person wrote about this book. Like they hated it beyond hate. Yeah. Can we talk about naming and like heuristics for a second? Because we talked about this a bit off mic, but what I love about impact players or multipliers, or even when you get into multipliers, you know, when you're being an accidental diminisher and an optimist and a protector, these words that now inside of our culture, we... We know what a multiplier is. We know what an accidental diminisher is. Also, you know, what? talk to me about the importance of these key words because just us understanding, having common language and actually taking a really large concept and boiling it down to a word or a phrase I find is very beneficial. Could you speak to that? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I very much see myself as a very serious researcher. I like to take on really hard workplace problems, you know, do high fidelity research, you know, don't claim things that we don't have evidence for. So I do all of that research, write a book, and then what I realize is that the primary value of all of it is a language. It's yeah. a language that people talk about. People often say, Liz, you know, what you do is you put a name on things. Like you give it in some ways like a handle. Like yeah. it's hard to hold something heavy without, an ha- without a handle. And, you know, my mother um, is a linguist and she was a speech pathologist. And I remember one of the ideas she sort of has drilled into me is that when, you know, children are growing up, if they don't have language, they don't have the ability to talk about, you know, like to even process certain kinds of ideas. And there are some really hard conversations in the workplace. One of them is, hey, boss, you are sucking the life out of me. Like, <laughs> I, like, and, and there's what, like, that's a hard conversation if you've got like a tyrannical, narcissistic, bully, know-it-all kind of boss. And maybe that's a conversation that goes nowhere. But let's say you've got like, your boss is a nice person. They're like a friend, a good guy, like someone who, who loves up her team Being able to tell that person, you are sucking the life out of me, but I know it doesn't seem like it to you because you think you're being helpful, that can be a really difficult conversation. And 
I think what has been helpful to people is having this language of the ways that we accidentally diminish, you know, by maybe being a rescuer, helping someone with a struggle rather than letting them kind of struggle through and build that muscle themselves, maybe being so um, protective that people never have to do anything difficult. Maybe it's um, responding so quickly that nobody else has to be agile. Like the boss is on it. Maybe it's like for me being an idea fountain, like boom, boom, we should do this. No one else has to do any creative thinking. It just, they look upwards. And so it's, it's allowed organizations to talk about hard issues in really easy ways. Yeah. And, yeah, I think and it's ha- a shared it, language. That- yeah, no, I say I, I agree what, what is what happened here after we kind of put multipliers into our culture is us being able to talk to each other. You know, one one of the, for our listeners out there one of the uh, accidental diminishing behaviors of a leader. And this is like what I've, is it you be a good leader and you have these characteristics. Mine, what I pulled the team is to be an, I'm an optimist. And I remember being like, well, really? I've been an optimist. I just yeah. been shocked uh, by this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <Nerd. Flamingos. laughs> I'm I sure. Coming. Comes, <laughs> and I'm like, well, why is this a bad thing? It's like, well, as, as explained in multipliers, if you are an optimist, you're not, you're not, letting their team know how hard something might be. And the simple reframe is just to signal the struggle, right? So uh, just for our listeners out there, instead of you know, being like, like, oh, this is great, you got this. It's like, no, this is really hard. Uh, Liz, I'm well aware of the amount of work it's gonna take to do this, but I think we can do it. That's a complete reframe. And like what I've found is even me being able to label things like, oh, Steven, you're being too much of an optimist right now, or you're being too much of a pace setter has just helped Mm. me as a leader, has helped the leaders around here have common language with each other. Actually, it makes calling people out on things a lot easier too. It does. And um, it's taken me over 10 years to figure this out. So I want, like, there's a hard way to become a multiplier leader. And then there's an easy kind of lazy way of doing it. And I really recommend the lazy way. And, you know, the hard way is to be hyper aware of all of your diminishing tendencies, your accidental diminishing tendencies, build a lot of multiplier skills, ask good questions, see if people say a genius. Like it works, but it is the harder way. And the easy way, the lazy way, is to just talk so openly and lightheartedly about your accidental diminisher tendencies is that you don't have to stop yourself, other people do. So if everyone knows Stephen's a great big optimist, And then you're being like, okay, we've got this new product line. You know, I love it. This thing is going to like sell. We're da 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 da. Then people can go like, Stephen, like, are you in optimist mode right now? Can we just talk about what might go wrong? Can we talk about what's hard? For me, I'm a big idea fountain. Love ideas. Hey, what about this? Have we thought about this? Have we considered this? Everyone knows this who works with me. They tease me about it. And so when I'm like, hey, I think we should do a piece of research that looks at the difference between this and this and this, you know, my team can say, Liz, do you want us to stop what we're doing and work on that? Or are you having one of your little idea parties? Yeah. I'm like, oh, (laughs) it's an absolute, this is an idea party. Like party with me for a moment and then ignore me as needed to get your job done. And so let's say a manager has 10 people working for her. Instead of having one person on vigil, you now have 10 people who can be watching for it and who can redirect you. And who really has the greatest skin in the game for you being a great leader? It's not you. Yeah. It's the people who work for you. Yeah. They're the ones who really are vested in you being a brilliant leader because they want to do brilliant work. So, like, let your team help you be a brilliant leader, but you have to create the language and then talk about it so openly and so often that it's not risky to say, you know what, Stephen, I really appreciate your offer of help, but I don't need a rescue. Like, it's just be like, dude, I got it. Your rescuer is kicking in. Let me suffer. Oh, that's such, that, that's such amazing insight, Liz, because I always say we run a very transparent company and I say like, when you're transparent, you always tell the truth. You never have to remember what you said because there's no lies in there. And 
what this makes me think of is I, if I'm calling out my blind spots constantly, then, uh, then the people, I don't necessarily have to, I should work on them, but if I'm calling them out, I'm basically handing over permission to everybody here to call them out alongside with me. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and that's such a, oh man, I love how that, like, I like, like, just, hey, if you're just honest, that's the, that, that is, you're gonna get the best result. That's the laziest form of a uh, uh, multiplying. It's, I mean, I'm gonna, this is uh, an incredible insight. The lazy way. The lazy way <laughs> is, the, 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 it's the fast path. It's the, the powerful path. So, Culture Gooder podcast, what, um, what does culture mean to you inside the workplace? You know, I, Oh, goodness, I've done so much study on culture. There's lots of definitions. Here's my simple definition. It's the norms that guide our daily decisions. It's the norms that that tell us what's going to get us in trouble and what's going to get us ahead. Like, what's going to make yeah. me a hero versus a loser inside of the organization? And they're just the things that say, like, do more of this and less of that. That's going to help get you ahead, that's going to get you into trouble. Oh, I like that. It's like all the invisible rules. I'm sure you have a better definition than that, but that's the one that helps me. Well, I think that everybody has their own definition. Um, you know, I think one thing that we've worked really hard on here is from the outside, it looks like we just slam margaritas all day. But you know, when you get inside, like our culture is actually, everything is fun, but our culture is built on loving your work and the people who thrive here are un- un- usually have the three characteristics of super driven, super generous and kind, and super uh, courageous. And and th- that's mm-hmm. kind of what we've cultivated cultivated here. Uh, can you talk about, since this, we're a sunglass company, can you talk about opportunity goggles? I just think like, it's just too perfect not to, uh, not to talk about this. Okay, so I love this. And um, I mean, I just love it so much. I just like blew my glasses off doing <laughs> it. So uh, one of the things we noticed, the big difference between the contributor mindset and the impact player mindset is how we see threat, how we see things that are messy, ambiguous, and uncertain. And, you know, as I kind of step back from all of the, the behavioral differences, it became very clear that impact players, they, they see opportunity where other people see threat. And it's not that they're like, it's not about seeing sunshine. It's not like, okay, this is a, you know, our, our biggest customer just like, you know, left us and we have supply chain problems. This is going to be great. It's like, wait a minute, this sucks, but this is an opportunity to make myself useful. It's an opportunity to lead. And so the name we gave it is like opportunity goggles. And then I get this. From my friends at Gooder. And I'm like, these are the best. I mean, are these not? I get, you sent me a couple and these are pretty good. These are nice. These are like opportunity <laughs> shades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but these, my friend, are opportunity goggles. And the idea is it's, it's not that we're, again, sort of seeing the world through rose-colored lenses. It's that we can look at a situation through a lens and ask, how is this an opportunity for me to lead? How is it an opportunity for us to differentiate ourselves? How is this an opportunity for us to do it differently? How is this an opportunity to build belonging? How is this an opportunity for us to like learn and pivot? Um, and they're kind of like goggles in that yeah. some people may naturally see the world this way, but it's something you can learn to do. Like, okay, this sucks. Like, I just got dealt a blow. I've been handed a messy problem. I've been given bad news. Let me dwell in that for a moment. Um, but then let me put on my goggles and go, okay, what does it look like now? Oh, I mean, uh, I, so I just I love, love, this love these. Yeah, I, I love this. I, I love this concept. And also, I'll, 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 I'll throw that out to our naming team. And maybe one day we can get a pair of... Uh, glasses uh, with opportunity goggle in the name. Ooh. Okay. So, and you've got to tell me how I love your sassy names. Um, How does that process work? How do you create the safety for people to come up with these big, bold names is like, do you have a naming genius that you just keep in the closet or is this a brain trust? Is this crowdsourced? Like dish it out. What? Yeah. So, so 
originally it was just me. It was me and my two co-founders, Ben and Carrie. We, like for the first handful of years, we kind of named everything. And Carrie and I kind of developed the voice together. And so we, we at first, we kind of, we started doing it. And then we started launching a lot more products. And where it's evolved to over the years is we have a copywriting team, but we will we will have the we'll have we'll have glasses made. We'll put it out to the company like, hey, here's the, some upcoming drops. We are trying to have a name that's focused on you know if it's a a trop you know this is a tropical. So we want everything to tie to tropical in some way, and then the copywriting team will kind of review it, come up with theirs, and there is a there is a healthy back and forth, and we we don't censor in those meetings, and we kind of have certain internal rules where we. We don't want to, we, we never punch down. We're never demeaning to people, right? We're trying to be fun and irreverent. And we can push the envelope in a responsible way. But now there's a team that we have a team of amazing copywriters that do it, but we also will crowdsource from the company. And so there is a certain priv, there is like a certain uh, pride people get if one of their names gets picked for the glasses now. I know. And so I might, I, because it's done inside the company, I'm like, I might have to find how to get on payroll because like, this is now new career goals, like name a gooder uh, pair of sunglasses. I mean, next time you're in LA, if you want to come to the office, I will get you in on a naming meeting. Okay. It would be fun to watch. Yeah. yeah. And I uh, love like, cause there's, in, you know, one of the things I've learned if, um, if I could sum up, I know you're not asking me to do this, but I'm going to offer it. is... Um, it's I can sum up multipliers into two words, sort of two yeah. and a half words. And and when I really step back and look at the difference between leaders who have a multiplying effect on others, where other people are at their best, they're deeply utilized, fully engaged, versus diminishing leaders, what multipliers fundamentally do is they create two conditions simultaneously. They create safety and they create stretch. And it takes Ooh. both of them because because like nobody wants to work for the leader who's all stretch, no safety. Yeah. That's miserable. That's stressful. That's diminishing. But we really don't have better luck working for leaders who are all safety, no stretch. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the kind of leaders, hey, Liz, we love you. We appreciate you. You're awesome. Woo! Yeah. But like never ask me to do something hard. And so stretch thinking, stretch work requires safety. Oh, and so okay. I just, I love like when I see bold work done, I like to think what was, what were the conditions both in that meeting and broadly in the culture that allowed people to do fiercely bold work? This, this, this is beautiful. Safety and stretch. Uh, could I agree more? So I'm going to get you out of here, Liz, with the last question. I'd love to know what's one status quo that you think needs to be challenged inside of the workplace right now? Well, I'm all for challenging job descriptions and org charts. They're bogus. But I think what we <laughs> need right now, and I'm not saying they're not necessary. They're, they're necessary, but not complete. Like it's a starting point. It should not be an end point um, to how mm -hmm. we think about work. But I think, um, uh, please uh, and don't interpret this as me pandering to your culture or the way you lead, but transparency is, I think, what we need right now. I think leaders who come in and create transparency across organizations can transform those organizations. Um, when you look at like what Alan Mulally did at Ford Motors by mm -hmm. saying, we're not going to have secret executive meetings. We are going to open things up. We are, we are, we are going to let people know how we're making decisions, what decisions have been made, why we're making decisions. That has, I think, a power to really transform. And there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of confusion right now. And I think transparency is is probably the, the lever. Yeah. That I pull, because having access to information is the raw ingredient for intelligent work. Like if you want people to be intelligent Give them access to information, context, framing, rationale that would allow them to go do great work and make great decisions. That's what I would oh, focus on. I and I know you guys agree. are all about that. So I really do believe it. that. Yeah, we're all about it. I believe in it. And uh, it's hard. It, it is not easy. And I think that's why more companies probably don't do it. It's easier to keep secrets. It is.
Awesome. Liz, thank you so much for being with us. I really, really appreciate you. Great conversation. Love the work you do. And I mean, honestly, like, opportunity goggles. To this. <laughs> thank you. And I like their, their cousin, the extreme dumpster diving, too. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Culture Gooder podcast. To submit questions for the podcast, learn more about our culture, and learn how you can status the quote challenge, head over to gooder.com slash culture. And don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you're listening, including on YouTube, where you can now watch all of our new episodes. Who knows? You might even catch a glimpse of Carl at our headquarters if he's not already passed out at the tiki bar from all the margaritas.